Hello, this is Anna Laura Brown, host of the Autoimmune Rehab Podcast, where we talk about how to actually thrive and heal your autoimmune condition, rather than just covering it up with pills or changing your diet and hoping you'll feel better one day. We feature solo episodes on helpful topics and interviews with guests who have actually walked in your shoes with autoimmune disorders and or who have years of experience in helping people to thrive and not just survive with autoimmune challenges. I'm a health coach who started this podcast because I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's in 2018 and wanted to inspire hope and transform health for people with autoimmune challenges. So keep listening and let's get you the help and hope you really need. This is the Autoimmune Rehab Podcast. So for today's episode, I am happy to welcome Zoe to the podcast. And Zoe is coming to us across from, from across the pond near London, England. And you'll be able to tell by her accent, I'm sure, <laughs> for those of you that are from the U.S. And yes. Is a basically a food consultant. So she's going to talk to us a little bit about, we're going to have this conversation about how to actually implement healthy eating and healthy cooking and not just hear about it, but how to make it actually a reality. So welcome to the podcast, Zoe. Why don't you start off by introducing yourself to us? Who are you and what brings you on to autoimmune rehab today? Okay, bless you. Thank you, Anna Laura. My name is Zoe Willis and I'm a family food consultant over in the UK. Um, I've been at home cooking for my five children for um, quite a quite a long time now. I'm able to run a busy household, cook from scratch. Um, one of the jokes that uh, we have is I can just open the fridge, give me a little bit of a vegetable and I can create a meal for 5,000 people. But I hadn't realized until a couple of years ago that this was a skill that many people didn't have. And so I created this um, business, this role as a family food consultant, where I'm able to come in with families that are struggling with their cooking, their eating habits, things like meal planning, uh, cooking to a budget, as well as families who are struggling to make dietary changes for health needs. My coaching program, I suppose, my one-to-one -one coaching program is that I'm working with these families to create meals, and uh, how would you say implementable I'm not even sure that's a word but I'm uh, implementable menus and ways of cooking that fits with their lives so I myself I've been gluten-free for about seven eight years um, so I really know how to cook from scratch gluten-free there's dairy free in there so I do have those skills and they've been greatly called for actually by a lot of my clients so yes so that's what I do um, my website is realliferealkitchen.com um, and that's where a lot of the magic happens yeah and I absolutely love that like I said because most people that are listening to this are going to relate to the whole idea that you know we get told oh hey you have to give up gluten or you have to give up dairy or uh -huh. you know you've got blood sugar issues or other autoimmune issues and you need uh -huh. to clean up your diet and therefore you can't have this you can't have that or you need to start yeah. cooking a lot more but then when it comes to an actual practical solutions about how to actually yeah. do it yeah. and especially even more so if you are I mean if you're single it might be a little easier but if you're yeah. dealing with a situation with children especially it's even mm -hmm. harder because kids can be picky eaters too so yeah. Yeah. You know, let's talk a little bit about that maybe too if maybe you're listening to this and you're facing likely autoimmune issues or being told that you need to change your diet but how would you recommend that somebody that is in a family that has kids and maybe the kids are a little picky and they're thinking, geez, now I'm going to have to start making cooking twice for all my meals. How would, a, how would you, what kind of words of wisdom would you have for solving that challenge? I, I think uh, the, what you will be working towards is only cooking once. You don't want to be cooking twice. You're a busy mum. You do not have time to be making three or four or five separate meals for everybody. So, that's where you will end up when you first start and you're speaking to your, uh, I don't know, your functional medicine practitioner and they say you've got to give up the gluten. Um, don't think you're going to be doing that overnight and that change will happen immediately because it won't. You'll be setting yourself up for disaster if you do that. What I recommend is looking at one meal in a day. So let's say what's the hardest meal you deal with? Is it dinner time when everybody's come home and they're tired after school? Is that a really tricky meal to be working with? Maybe it's breakfast. Find the trickiest meal of the day and have a plan. 
and say, right, we're just going to do breakfast for a week and make some gentle changes with that. OK, so let's say it might be that you need to put eggs into breakfast because eggs are gluten free. Maybe you need to start talking to your children and slowly introducing alongside their main breakfast, something like the eggs on the side. Um, so you start making those changes gradually after a couple of weeks and you feel, yep, we got the rhythm on with breakfast. Breakfast has gone gluten and dairy free. Excellent. Then you gently move on to your next thing. Might be the snacks, might be lunch that you need to start thinking about. And then final meal. If dinner is your kind of if it is a tricky one for you as well, maybe you leave dinner to be the last thing that you tackle. So this is what you're looking for. It's just gradual, gradual, gradual. And it might be that after two, three weeks, a child says, no, I'm not having the eggs anymore. OK, fine. Pull it back a bit. Have a week back to normal and then gently bring it in. The difficulty of making these changes straight away is because you've got so many personalities within a family it's really quite hard to make those dramatic changes immediately you need everybody on board with that sort of thing so think of this as a process trial and error um one of the other things that i suggest is if that you're going to be trying something that to your family would be super exotic and like just too much i don't know maybe too many vegetables or something I'd suggest maybe on a weekend when things are quieter is having lunch as your main meal. And that's when you could gently introduce more exotic um, ingredients or more exotic um, meals for your family. Because at lunchtime, children are not as tired as they are at the end of a day after a busy school day. And there's a bit more chance of just trying something, having a bit of a play and um, success, quite frankly. So there are various kinds of strategies that you can you can deploy and just depends on the family. So when I talk to a family, I kind of gauge where the children are at, also where the spouse is at. So whoever's doing the main bit of cooking, they kind of need to have the support of the spouse because it's no good if you're doing all the cooking, you're doing all the cooking from scratch, you're doing very, very well, and then your beloved has a big drawer full of sweets right in front of you. Or oh, maybe yeah. <laughs> yeah oh, you know, and they're like, this is my special drawer. And you're like, okay, you got to take the drawer and the nonsense away. So uh, I'll give you, you know, a personal example. In my household, um, my husband's fine. He seems to be able to eat anything. He doesn't have any autoimmune problems. Um, but then that means in the house, we have nothing that's gluten. But when he's out and about, if he wants to have something, you know, sandwich or, or whatever he wants, then fine, go for it. But it does need to be out of the house because otherwise you just have too many, it's too many temptations, too many temptations. And particularly if you're in the kitchen and cooking, when you're hungry and you see kind of, uh, I don't know, just biscuits or bread right in front of you, that's, that's a big temptation. It's a big temptation. Yeah. So, yeah, you do need the support. Um, yeah, for these things. Yeah, absolutely. I would say so. I would say having the support is definitely key. What yeah. other kinds of mistakes would you say that people have a tendency to make other than, you know, obviously trying to go too fast, maybe yeah. not having support? What other kinds of either mistakes or challenges would you say that people come across when they start implementing something like this? So what people will immediately do is go, oh, my gosh, bread. I can't live without bread. You know, there's this immediate panic. I can't live without pasta. There's there's what what I find is the automatic is to say, right, I'm going to replace normal bread, normal pasta with the gluten free stuff. Now, certainly the gluten free bread that's over here, anything you buy at the supermarkets, it's, it's full of processed nonsense. There's so much sugar in it, the preservatives, the emulsifiers, it's it's not great. It really isn't good. Look, occasionally, fine, 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 fine. But for that to be your sort of sandwiches every day, or um, I, I mean, the nonsense aside, but the cost. So the first thing is people just immediately switch for kind of a gluten free, or if they're going dairy free, they buy vegan cheese, which again, nonsense, full of nonsense. What you need to start thinking about is what can I eat? So I can eat potatoes, I can eat sweet potatoes, I can eat vegetables, meat, no gluten or dairy and meat. And I've said eggs, you know, you can, when you, rice, another example, although some celiacs can struggle with that, but 
when you start thinking of what I can eat, it's like a switch goes off in your head and you think, oh, actually meat, meat, and, meat and potatoes and a couple of veg. I can do that. I could do that every meal. Do, do, do you see what I mean? It All of a sudden things open up to you um, when you have that more positive mindset. But yes, I suppose the, the, the first thing is people will go, oh, I just make that automatic switch to the fake bread or the fake cheese and I'll be fine. Not realizing the effect that's going to have on their bodies. Um, and actually it isn't the healthier, it isn't the healthier choice. So, so yes, so that, I suppose that's one of the, um, the other big, mis oh, I don't like the word mistakes, but um, that's one of the other things that people tend to do when they realize they need to make that change. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I know I was guilty of that too, in the beginning when I first went gluten-free, because I've been gluten-free for like 15 years now, you know, yeah. And I did that same thing. And you're right. It's really not good and healthy for you. It's, yeah. you know, and in fact, unless you have celiac disease, you're, uh, yeah. I might as well say it, you're better off eating the regular bread with the gluten yeah. in it than the gluten-free stuff. Because a lot of the yeah. gluten-free stuff just really has so much loaded junk in it that yeah. it's, it's just really not good for you. Yeah, it's, they take you know, the whole food and basically process it into all kinds yeah. of stuff. And yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's again it's been really fascinating on this this um this journey, this journey I'm on. But I've always had an awareness of kind of the nonsense in food and the effect of processed rubbish, but I've found it really interesting how few people do know this do know actually they look at a pack and they go oh it's low fat that'll be fine um i mean i remember talking to a lady years ago and she said oh i stopped having hummus stopped having hummus she used to make her own hummus so she's freshly made she's like i stopped having it when i found out how much fat was in there and i'm like oh no <laughs> homemade homemade hummus made out of you know she used fantastic quality stuff but she hadn't realized that they're good fats, they're bad fats. And then she was going and buying the low fat nonsense from the supermarket. Again, you looked at the ingredients, you went, oh dear. So it, it, what is a wonderful privilege of what I do is showing people what's possible, what they can do, what they can create and the deliciousness that they can create from a few simple ingredients. That's, that's a real pleasure. Um, and also seeing the changes within families' lives as well, when they go, ah, yes, I am feeling better. Meal times are proving much more positive. I can make these changes and it's benefiting, physically benefiting us. But you can see that how relationships are improving as well. It's a really, really powerful thing. Awesome. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, I'm sure it's the same in the UK as it is here in the U States. The food companies have really, you know, with their marketing and their mm. adding things to make us addicted and all kinds of things, you know, have made us think that certain kinds of things are either okay or not okay when yeah. the reality is that fat's not a big deal as long as it's the right kind of fat and it's real yeah. food, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And that's, 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 it, it's so important. And I mean, over here in the UK, um, we've got a television doctor called Chris Von Tulliken. He's just released a book about ultra processed foods. And it's, I mean, I knew about the nonsense, but reading this, I've gone, oh, golly, it's, re it's, it, it's incredible how it feeds into kind of every element of um, people's lives. It's really quite incredible. And yet it's so empowering to know that could take a few vegetables and just create a feast it's really lovely to be able to see families to take that ownership and bring it back into the home and say do you know i can do this i can have control of what goes into my body um so yes yeah, so that's something that is a real real pleasure to support as well that's awesome cool so now let's talk about maybe some interesting or practical things so what would you say are a couple of your favorite healthy meals that you like to recommend for families anything that comes Ooh. to mind specifically that you find are some good healthy favorites i think one of the things i'm going to come back to breakfast because for so many children they'll be the kind of right they just have cereal or something and you have the crash for a lot of kids when they get to school they have the crash and then the bad behavior and all of this because their bodies are just struggling i find that one of the easiest things to do is just give your kid some eggs give them some 
good quality bacon, some decent sausages, something savory for breakfast, some good protein. And that, I think that's probably the, the, the simplest and the most effective thing you can give your children to really start them off, um, to start them off well for the day. So that's that's an immediate change that that you can make there. Um, one of the other things I love doing, because again, I like creating lots of meals out of leftovers, but is taking a huge bit of meat. I love here in the UK, we have a great tradition of the Sunday roast. So lovely bit of meat, be it beef, be it lamb, nice roast chicken, all the vegetables cooked in the the fat from the lamb or the chicken, and just all this this sort of really loveliness. But it's a meal that's quite you can make it really big and then any leftover meat that then becomes your meals for the for the rest of the week you know so i quite like that because roast meat again back to our point meat's gluten free um the vegetables gluten free dairy free that's your main meal as a family but then you can create these wonderful leftover stews and curries and soups and all kinds of things out of it so um so yes so i probably kind of say really simply eggs eggs and savory for a breakfast and then a nice big chunk of meat at some point over your weekend that can become some good leftovers yeah that's good i like that that's awesome yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i'm doing that so so yes yeah, so that's my my kind of top tips yeah Cool. Awesome. So any other tips that we haven't discussed yet at all? I think like with need to think about. I think one of the things that um is quite important for families in general when it comes to cooking, particularly uh, you know, particularly mums, because it's usually the mums who are mainly in charge of cooking and um running the kitchen. I think one of the things we need to consider is, is is being intentional with anything in life. If you say, for example, today, I'm going to read a book for an hour. Today, I'm going to go for a run. Today, I'm going to get up and go to work. You prepare for that. And yet, for some reason, people go, oh, I should be able to cook. I should, I should be able to just go gluten-free like that. What you really need to do is carve out a bit of time to sit down and say, right, let's make a plan here so that's something that a lot of people don't consider um and something that people should consider to make their transition transition easier and and also i i also want to say don't beat your, don't beat yourself up because you can just pick yourself up again and and have another go it's not a problem but that's where i come in again as a family food consultant if people are saying i just need someone to hold my hand for a bit and i want to shoot some ideas out there and um i need to make this fit with my busy life that's where i come in and we can talk things through and um i'm you know i prepare meal plans shopping lists because also one of the other things is when you are cooking in a new way when we go to the supermarket or wherever we get our food from we get used to being in a habit of walking in a particular route we know where things are when you're busy you just want to be in and out i know what i need in and out when you're making these kind of dietary changes you actually have to go and have a special trip around the supermarket where you can take your time this is where the vegetables are this is where i don't know the lentils are so that you know these new places and then next time you go to the supermarket with your new shopping list for your new recipes, you know where you've got to go. It's one less bit of overwhelm in the brain that you've got to deal with. Absolutely. That's great. And I know, I'm assuming this is probably similar in the UK, but I know in the US, a lot of grocery stores now these days have apps you can get on your phone where you can actually pull mm. up and look at the food. You can read the labels. You can take yeah. a look at the prices. You can familiarize yourself with what's available in the store before yeah. you walk in. Yeah, yeah, because and they're so they're so planning. clever, aren't they? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're so clever. The way the um the the kind of psychology of food displays is also a really interesting topic. Um, I mean, I again, I'm not sure if that it probably is the case in the in the in the US, but certainly here in the UK, we can do food delivery. So you oh, can have yeah. supermarket mm -hmm. deliveries. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also quite that's also quite a good way to really make sure you're not tempted to get anything else. And you can time it to arrive at a time when you're actually able to organize and food prep. So that's another thing to consider. When would be a good time for me to actually take a couple of hours out to food prep? Make sure your shopping arrives then. 
you know when your shopping to arrive three days after the time you could have food prepped if it all happens at once it just flows it all just flows so yes yeah that's so. a good point i like that so focus on things like you know like prepping as in like chopping vegetables yeah. and things and potentially yeah. even putting into the freezer extra meat yeah. things like that so that you have the ingredients all there on hand yeah. because the other thing I've noticed I'm sure you've noticed this too is if you don't have the food there and prepped and ready for you mm -hmm. to do the cooking then it's not going to happen you can't just all of a sudden 10 minutes before dinner open the fridge and say oh what are we having tonight <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. And when you've got, I mean, after school, when you've got like hordes of hungry children and everybody's just going feral and your you decision fatigue, all the chaos, that is not the time to be saying, right, children, I'm going to make a 10 course meal and it's going to be very elaborate and fabulous. No, not the time. Definitely not the time. Um, I actually have on my website because I, I had a dear friend a few years ago and she would had this difficulty every time it would get to sort of three o'clock she's picking the children up at quarter past three and she'd go what am I going to feed them and I'm like you've been at home all day you've been at home all day what what you've left it to this last minute so with this wonderful lady of mine I mean she, she was amazing she's an amazing lady um I created it. it's on my website I've called it the seven day pantry challenge where it's you can open your pantry in these moments of crisis. Let's not make them too regular. But you go, what am I going to feed the people? Ah, got a bag of lentils. And it's three things you could do with that bag of lentils. So it's using all these pantry staples. Um, and you can make, uh, so it's, it's dinner times. So there's a couple of breakfast ideas in there as well. But it's like a fallback in times of that crisis when you really have, I just don't know what I'm going to do. All the recipes on that are dairy-free and gluten-free. Um, and it's also just quite nice to have 21 easy recipe ideas as well, particularly when you're starting off going gluten and dairy-free. So, oh. um, so, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, everybody will definitely want to visit her website, which we'll have it linked is the realliferealkitchen.com. She's got like an ebook with some really delicious recipes of gluten-free and dairy-free. She's got, I think, even like a guide for first-time moms. So if you're... Yeah. You know, just becoming a mother, she's got a guide on how to do that, which, you know, like she mentioned, she has five children. So she's definitely a qualified expert in that arena. And looks like she's got <laughs> different blog posts on all different kinds of topics. So yeah, you know, definitely yeah. some yeah. good information to help you get started in this journey. And yeah, like you said, realize that you want to focus on what you can do and what you can yeah. eat, not yeah. what you can't have. And that's what... Yeah we've talked about a lot here on this podcast with people is yeah. too often we get slapped with whether it's an autoimmune diagnosis or some other kind of a health issue and, or, you know, diet restriction. Then all of a sudden we go AWOL and crazy over what we can't have or can't do anymore rather than focusing on what we can have and what we yeah. can do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then as soon as you start going, what can I do? You realize there's just this incredible world of deliciousness out there um, that everybody enjoys. And I mean, cooking from scratch and eating together as a family and eating well as a family. I mean, it's one of the foundation stones of civilization, quite frankly. So, yeah. It's, yeah, uh, well, and it's becoming a lost art, unfortunately, and too many people aren't doing it. And it's, yeah, yeah it's definitely to the detriment of a lot of people's health and well-being, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's let's take back that power. Let's take back that power one meal at a time, Anna Laura. And let's yeah. change the world. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, these have been some great tips that you've shared. So yeah, I definitely encourage everybody to go check out your website, check out the freebie she's got. And before we get going, let's ask you the one question I always like to ask people. So if you could go back in time to, let's say, oh, you know, about 20 years ago or so before you were gluten-free and before you really had this aha moment about, you know, the importance of cooking from scratch and before you really had any of your kids, that kind of thing, what would you kind of advice would you give yourself that you kind of wish maybe somebody else had given you? So uh, I'll, I'll tell the story about 24, 25 years ago, I was a student at university just about to finish my final exams and I was exhausted, so weary. I was falling asleep in the afternoon. I just had the brain fog. I was really very, very weary, which a woman in age 21 shouldn't be. So I went to see a kinesiologist who said, right, wheat, that's the problem. Wheat, got to just take it out of your diet. Now, um, again, I'm going to presume 
students in the US, a similar students in the UK. There's a lot of bread, pasta, <laughs> everything had wheat, and I didn't know what to do. So I did nothing. I ignored it. Um, essentially, I have become the person I needed 24, 25 years ago. I, um, I just needed somebody to sit down and say, let's do this step by step. Just maybe not have bread for lunch. Let's find some other options for you. I just needed somebody to help. And I mean, yes, we had the internet then, but it wasn't as full of information as it is these days. However, having somebody to guide you makes a huge difference. It really does. So I think I needed at the time, if I could go back, I probably would have said, you need to find some other gluten-free people and talk to them and see what yeah. they do and learn from them and cook like them. So, so yes. Good. Exactly. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah. I love Thank that. You. Oh yeah. So like I said, everybody check out your webs, check out her website. Again, it's real life, real kitchen.com. We'll have it linked in the description and you know, whatever path you choose to pursue, get some help from somebody. I mean, if for some reason you decide that it's always not an actual fit to get help from, get help from somebody. Don't just sit around and say, I'm too overwhelmed yep. to make any diet changes. I'm too overwhelmed to change my life. Therefore, I'm not going to get any help and therefore not going to do anything and just going to sit here and suffer because I don't want to seek out any help because there's help all around you. And, you know, if you've listened to any other podcast episodes, you know that pretty much everybody that's been on the podcast has some kind of help to offer. Yeah. So yeah. there's yeah. an abundance of help. And she does work with people all in all different countries, I'm sure, because she does yeah. a lot of virtual yeah. too, as well as the in-person yeah. people that live in England. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are options. There are options. So bless you. Thank you. Yeah. So that's, I think, probably to summarize the whole gist of this conversation is that there are options and you don't have to be overwhelmed and you can do it. You can make home cooking a part of your life, whether, you know, we've been talking about doing it as a family, but if you're single, you can do it. The same principles apply, although it's a lot of ways, maybe even easier if you're single, because you don't have to deal with multiple yeah. people and their habits and their pickiness yeah. and that kind of thing. But yeah, you can do it. And if you found this episode helpful, we would appreciate a review, any comments, feedback you want to give us, and look forward to sharing with you again next week on another episode of the Autoimmune Rehab Podcast.